Okay, hello everybody. Week 39 of ENM 2020. We're in this long series of, of discussion sessions. Um, and the topic for today is biotic interactions versus abiotic requirements. So we're talking about the Eltonian noise hypothesis or the, the simple um, simplifying assumption of, yeah, we're just gonna ignore all those biotic interactions when we run our models. And so we've talked about this, we've tossed out theory, we've tossed out ideas, but let's, let's get down to it. Um, Enrique, you're gonna model some species. Do you include just physical uh, environment or do you include other species? That's first question. And second, which we'll come to in 20 minutes is how do you include the other species? But first of all, physical environment versus other species, both actually. No, of, of course, ideally we, we would like to include the influence of, of the interacting species with our tar target species. Uh, even in, in, in the more conceptual uh, side of, of, the, of the niche theory, those proposed by, by, by Hutchinson, the, the dimensions of the niche include those interactions. If we can put in, in the Cartesian uh, fashion, the problem is how to include them. Uh, and uh, th that makes another problem, which is that most people think that in ecological niche models are only uh, useful for physical variables and not uh, biological variables because of the bias that this has generated or this lack of information has generated. So yes, my position is that if we can include them, we should include them. You, you are mute. You are yeah. co-author of a book that asserts that in most cases, the manifestation of distributional constraints that correspond to physical variables most frequently will be on broad uh, spatial extents. And that the manifestation of distributional constraint that has to be has to do with biotic interactions will be on fine spatial extents. And so what your book asserts is that most of the time the biotic interactions will happen within the pixels determined by the abiotic relationships. Are you backing away from that assertion? <laughs> no, it's a matter of scale, that's right. Ah, so if we're working yeah. on, let's say, if we're working on 10 kilometer resolutions, we can just ignore biotic interactions? No, you are being mean today, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Just today? <laughs> uh, I think that uh, the, the complication is that biotic intera interactions uh, change in, in the geography more, more uh, frequently than the physical variables change. So you have a, a set of in, interacting species in one place, but you have a different set of interacting species in a different, not necessarily far away uh, place. So the difficulty of this is how to integrate all this information in a geographical fashion. Okay, so if I'm working at 10 kilometer resolution, I don't have to worry about biotic interactions because it's all happening within those pixels. Now Jorge is saying, what? Something. Uh, sorry, we, we missed you because your, your audio was pretty bad. Uh-oh. 
So if I'm working at 10 kilometer spatial resolution, <laughs> then those rapid changes that you just mentioned, do those mean that all those interactions are happening or not happening within each of my pixels? And so I can just ignore the biotic interactions? That's what we actually do, but we, we shouldn't do that. Jorge. Oh, Jorge, help me. <laughs> I think that Enrique is quite right. Uh, and in fact, in our own conceptualization, we know that species interactions probably play a role, an important role. I think that our main problem is a problem of data on the one hand, we don't have much data on how interactions happen at small scales because they are very dynamic and they, if you are a predator and some prey is uh, at low density, you probably just switch prey and the interaction changes. Or um, if you are a pollinator, uh, you may also switch uh, flowers and so on. But there are cases in which you know the interaction as a very strong interaction and probably even a one-to-one -one interaction, which is very important for the fitness of the focal species. I'm thinking, for instance, an insect with food plants where there is just one food plant and you have to eat that or you die. Well, in that case, you can include that interaction by including another layer with a model for your food plant. And that has been done. And in general, it improves predictions. So I think there is, a, there is some evidence that at least for very strong interactions, A, biology matters, and B, you can include it if you are capable of modeling the first, uh, one of the two species, the, 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 the critical species for your focal species, if you can do it, if you can model it using ENM techniques, then you can add it as another layer to your predictions. And there are a few papers about that. Uh, besides the, the naturalists, the, 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 the biologists know that even at geographical scales, certain species are limited in the ranges by other species uh, without modeling, just by, uh, well, knowing, knowing the, the natural history of things. So uh, the point that species matter, it's, I mean, we all agree about that. The, the thing is that we don't know how to deal with it because of lack of theory and because of lack of data. That's a complication. That would be my, my two cents. Do you, that's do you, we do call you it think it's, Sorry. Do you think it's a lack of theory? I, I would like to think that it's not a lack of theory, uh, it's, uh, I mean, I think the theory is the one that is telling us that they do matter at some extent and at some scale. And, but the theory is also telling us that it's a lot more complicated than what we can think of. Like there are a lot of interactions that are one way in some places and a, a different way in, in a different place, just because okay. the community changes even with the same species. Let me and, just uh, go and finish my run. Yeah, and for instance, like one of the key things that I think Jorge said is uh, strong interactions or, or really key interactions. Because like there's a lot of like theory saying that competition may be driving a lot of these patterns, but we actually see that competition doesn't matter at a lot of the scales that we work. For instance, like jaguars, they should be uh, avoiding a, a puma or a, a mountain lion or an or a ocelot or a margay to exist in a place. But there are trap cameras that detect those all those species in the same place, in the same point in the earth. So the only thing is that they are, do not coexist at the same time. But in the terms that we work, like in the geographic extent and resolution that we work, they are all there. So competition is not a, uh, an important or a key interaction in that sense. 
but one of the the positive interactions that you mentioned it's really important like the dependency positive for one of the species the dependency of a butterfly for the caterpillar st uh, stage on one of these plants like in a specific species of, of plant i think that one matters a lot and with that we can do something but there are a lot of things we cannot do let me just just clarify what i meant by lack of theory uh when you have two species you know more or less what is going to happen when you have three species you don't know because three species are compatible with any behavior including chaotic behavior and if you have five or six or seven species you don't really know what's going to happen the, the theory is not there i mean there is a linear theory about around uh, equilibrium points which is followed <laughs> by in 50 60 70 years ago but, but we are always away from equilibrium points we are always in the in the trans, in the, in the, in the dynamical phase so what I meant by no theory is that the theory that we have is good for two species. And we normally live in a world with more than two species. When you have two species, then you can do it. And that's what, going back to that strong interactor, one, maybe two, but five? Who knows what's going to happen? Enrique? Well, uh, you, haven't, you haven't said a word, Tom, so I, I will yield you the privilege, but I have a point here. Make your point. Okay. This is just an idea, but uh, in in probably in most instances, the identity of the interact interaction interactive species is not important. It doesn't matter if it's species A, B, or C. What matters is more like the like the functional trait of of, of that species. If, if they are, for example, if we are modeling carnivore, if they have sufficient uh, food, you would like to have uh, information on the available biomass of species of certain size or or predators of certain size that may be competitors or, or things like that, most than, uh, more, more than specific uh, formation on, on the species. So the load of parasites, for example, or the, the available biomass of, of, of uh, predators or something, some things like that more related to the functional traits. So if we can have maps of, of functional traits, we can use, the, we could use those as, as predictor variables too. It's just an idea, I haven't explored that, but I think that would be worth exploring. So what you're suggesting is essentially to collapse down what may be a multiple species system to our focal species and a collective, which is the other. Oh, right. the milieu, the biological milieu by Brian Inquist and, and Brian McGill. That the, the rest is called the, the, the biological milieu. Okay. So but, I, mean, I think I think this is this is setting our field up to be a little bit weak because, I mean, I, I agree with everything that everybody has said. I mean, Jorge, you're right on. If, if we're talking about, you know, something that pollinates uh, flowers, you know, collects nectar from flowers um, and just needs something that's red and tubular, then there probably aren't gonna be very direct effects between any one species and our species of interest. Or if you just need you know, mammals between this big and this big, there, there's probably lots to choose from. And the biotic effects probably just disappear because everywhere there's a way to solve that problem if you're that pollinator or that predator. But there are certainly 
cases in which you have direct one-to-one -one kind of key interactions. And what Enrique just suggested is kind of a one-to-many where the interaction is key for the focal species, which is to say, I don't care what species of tinea that I have in my gut, I just care about whether I have a tinea in my gut or not. Mm -hmm. right? You don't care about the name. So where I think we come up kind of as a field as being pretty weak is then, I guess you could call this the Eltonian shortfall. <laughs> but the fact that, yeah, for some species that are relatively well studied and that come from regions with a lot of scientists, we have these classic cases of interactions that are well known and we would build those interactions into our models. And then for the other 99% of the world and the other 99.999% of the species, we don't have the faintest idea. And so we set ourselves up to be able to being able to include interactions only in cases where we know that the interactions are important. That's a pretty damning uh, situation. I think that technology is going to help us when we start being able to record interactions locally at large scales. But uh, we're still a bit, I mean, things like those cameras give us some idea of what the future may look like, but it's still, Still, uh, still far in the, into the future. But what those do is those record co-occurrence. They don't record the interactions. I mean, you might get lucky and see the puma eat the margay, but almost all the time, you're just going to see a puma here and a margay here. I read a paper that says that the coexistence means exactly as, as interactions, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, what Jorge is referring to is, is this body of literature and shall we say body of debate. I'll put it in the link for the course. Um, but there's a body of literature that asserts that co-occurrence, essentially positive interactions in a spatial sense can be used to infer the type and direction of biotic interaction. And shall we say, um, that's one side of the debate. And another side of the debate is that co-occurrence is probably a prerequisite for interaction. But knowing that two species are positively associated in space may mean that they interact negatively, may mean that they interact positively, or may mean that they don't interact at all. So again, I'll, I'll put the link to that in the, in the course page. Uh, it's a debate in the pages of biodiversity informatics, um, but don't fall into the, into the fallacy of equating spatial overlap with biotic interaction. Sorry, Jorge, you were gonna say something. Uh, in, uh, two days ago, we discussed the paper in the seminar discussion in a very interesting paper in a totally obscure journal that none of us is going to read it ever, uh, that basically posed a model for how niches would of interacting species would affect other niches. And showing that you may have a perfectly ellipsoidal fundamental niche, but if you have an interactor which is across, you will split into uh, which I, I thought it was very interesting and very intriguing. Uh, I, again, I don't think we have much, a lot of data. And besides, we don't have a lot of the details, the local details, for instance, at what, how do they move the, the individuals of the species at what hours of the day or what time of the day or what times of the year. Maybe they are in the same pixel, but completely diff active, different, whatever, all those things. But in any case, what that paper showed was that uh, you may, 
uh, affect the shapes of fundamental niches by the presence of other species. And when those species have positive signs, you expand your fundamental niche. That was a very cool um, image of that paper. It's, so that wouldn't um, be affecting the shape of the fundamental niche, at least in no, the- No, no, realize the realize. Thank you. You begin with fundamental with our ellipsoids, and you end with realize with our the result of all the things, and they have weird shapes, and they may be larger in some parts where there is a positive interactor, and completely shrunk in places where there is a negative interactor, and very complicated shapes. It was, I mean, an interesting paper. You guys have seen, everybody seen the, the <coughs> Venn diagram that Jorge and I presented in 2005 for the BAM. Okay, we've talked about that interminably uh, in this course. Bear in mind that Venn diagrams are reductive in nature. And so that implies for the biotic uh, interaction part, that implies that interactions are negative. That's not always true. There are positive interactions. And what a positive interaction would do is increase the size, but you can't show that with overlapping circles. I just want to clarify that <clears throat> the journal is obscure because, yeah, we are not going to go to that journal to read theory or things like this that we found, <laughs> but it's journal of open source software. And, so, and it's, uh, it's the uh, journal uh, where, where like people having software in GitHub publishes or the software that is incredible. It was actually an R package, right, Jorge? It wasn't yeah. about the theory, it was about the program, but it was yeah. interesting how, did, how they presented it. And it's interesting because we were just mentioning that we cannot actually see those changes in niches, like in the actual geography, because even though species compete, they, because of environmental heterogeneity or uh, like time heterogeneity in the area, uh, that doesn't, you cannot see it in the geography. Like you can have the same species in the same point, but at different times of the day or at different seasons or stuff like that. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, the proposal about like having another species reducing your uh, realized niche. Uh, it's interesting, although like it has the same problems, even though it's in the environmental space. It will be something really complicated. We have talked about how the fundamental niche needs to be some uh, a concave, simple, convex, simple uh, shape. But the realized niche can get, can can be really really crazy. Like we, we see that when we apply like these methods, like the kernels we do from the occurrence records and you see those things, like they are really non-simple uh, non <laughs> shapes. Okay, so we've now talked for 20 minutes about the idea, but now how would we do this effectively? Now, certainly there's a way of distilling the biotic interaction information into simpler, more measurable quantities. So Enrique suggested, for example, biomass of prey. Okay, so notice we've lost all the identity of the interactor species. We don't care whether it's an opossum or a, a raccoon or this or this or this. We just care about how many kilograms of, of mammal flesh, right? Ideally, how would this be done? And I wanna bring back one bit of memory from earlier in the course. We've talked about how, um, well, very early in the course, Jorge talked about how mapping the interactions is effectively impossible because, you know, see that he's allergic to my saying that. Um, so if we were to want to create a map of, let's say, you know, number of competitors present within one meter of you, it's impossible, okay? 
But let's let's hybridize that thought with what Kate Ingenloff presented a few weeks ago, where she brings in the time dimension. And so instead of you know one spot on the map having one set of environmental characteristics, that same spot on the map now has a whole trajectory of environmental characteristics that are specific to that point in time and in space. And so that might be yearly or monthly or weekly or minutely or secondly, right? So what would maps of biotic interactions be like if we had a time-specific world? And could we ever imagine creating those temporally explicit maps of environment, biotic environment? Well, it depends entirely on how temporally those interactions like are. There are some interactions that are like, it depends on hours or minutes sometimes in the day. And there are other interactions that depend on more like changes in seasons or stuff like that. Like, and, and for all of those, I think the geographic scale matters as well because sometimes in, in a like one kilometer pixel, you cannot detect that. Like, like for instance, here in the prayer, some of the plants are much, doing much better and are more widespread than others at the beginning of the spring. But then later, the others <clears throat> get better and then this, they like they expand and the other ones get shrink so, in the same pixel. So I guess we would require a lot more <clears throat> resolution, finer resolution for those kind of things as well, right? Yeah, exactly. All I'm trying to point out is that I think we have the framework, we just don't have the data. I mean, there's probably some experimental situation where you had you know, a few interactor species and you might be able to you know, map the other species for your one species explicitly through time. Maybe you could do this with your duckweeds, right? Yeah, but what I'm I was thinking about that and your drunk. Huh? I was thinking about things like that with your drone. With the drone, yeah. You could put a drone over the pond. And so long as you can identify the different species, then you could have a map of each of the species beyond the one that is focal. So it's feasible. I'm just suggesting that it's not very practical. You could imagine creating time-specific ecological niche models where some of the independent variables are biotic in nature. And that would get you away from this uh, problem that Jorge pointed out years and years ago, which is that abiotic dimensions are non-interactive and relatively static, whereas biotic dimensions may be more interactive and more variable. You don't like that, Jorge? Yeah, it's uh, exactly. Some or a few non-biotic variables do not interact. They are conditions. Some of them, they do interact. I mean, a species can affect the pH, for instance, of the soil around the roots or other things. but. Uh, many important ones this is this is the one thing that we learn from from niche modeling there are certain non-interactive variables that matter for the distribution of species it's the, the, the big empirical fact because we are able to predict where they are going to be by using just uh, a few non-interactive variables but uh, when you want to go into high resolution or for other kinds of species you seem to need the, the biological part, and it's so complicated. 
um, among the natural history that I have been collecting on this topic, there is a spider that preys is the same species of spider on that it's a crab spider. So it sits on the flowers of a particular species of plant. And in some parts of the range of the plant, it preys mostly on pollinators. And in another part, preys mostly on seed um, predators. So the same couple of species in one part, their, their relationship is, is, is negative. And in another part, their, their relationship is positive when it's preying on the seed predators. So, so where is the data for that? Jorge, you said um, when the, that basically things get messy when we go to fine spatial resolutions. Yep. What are fine spatial resolutions? The, the resolution of the activities of individuals, whatever that means. Okay, for so, for so, so we want to go from individual home range or individual activity sizes to populational extents instead yeah, of... The, 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 extents. What, what is a fine grain or, or local size is different from an aphid or an ant and for a, an eagle or, or, or a big cat. And so it may well be that our maps of abiotic variables never get down to those individual dimensioned uh, yeah. resolutions. Yes, we do with uh, satellite imagery. Yeah, satellite imagery gets down to 30 meters, five no, meters in a, in a good day. So with aphids, that's, I mean, their individual ranges might be a meter. The, a, a centimeter. Uh, aphids, aphids can can be stuck on on the on a leaf, and if they they are perforating the vein, they do well. And if a millimeter away, they do very bad. So uh, it's the the scale of resolution is entirely dependent on the species you are dealing with. That's uh, what, you what matters. That's right? important. But but the, but the general idea, I think, I believe, is what are the um, activities of individuals of the species, not not the entire population, but individuals. Well, this brings us to a, a, a more fundamental question: on w at what scale should should we should we look for for uh, interactions to be uh, to influence the distribution of species, I mean, at what level, n n not not geographical or spatial scale, but uh, the level of individuals, populations, or species. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> but but all of our theory is cast at the populational level, right? I mean, we know yeah. that if if two individuals get together, you know. Uh, uh, a Republican and a Democrat, they're going to duke it out. Or, you know, species A and species B, both of which like this particular food, they're going to fight. But we've, we've been treating this idea of niche as a populational characteristic. Or a species characteristic. I, I'd like to speak about it as a populational characteristic and obviously, many times we work with it as a species characteristic, but we should be looking to make sure there's not population to population variation in the niche. Well, what, what we take as an assumption, probably, is that our occurrences represent populations, population. right? Yes. Yes, population. Yes. Even though they are individuals, yeah, certainly we assume that they they represent the population. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so I'm just putting this together. The Eltonian noise hypothesis is certainly relevant as we go to very coarse scales. We expect that biotic interactions, most of the time, will taper off in their effect. But when we have key one-to-one -one or one-to-few interactions, 
there may still be more import there may still be important effects at geographic extents. The theory is very clear for one to one interactions and then gets very messy and very underdeveloped as soon as we go beyond a few species, potentially as soon as we go beyond two species. Mm -hmm. And um, niche modeling is basically going to have to assume those ideas out of existence, except if we can solve this challenge of mapping the biotic dimensions through time across the entire extent of interest. Is that all fair to say? Unless we are able to map the biotic interactions across all time, uh, the, the, the relevant time span. Yeah. Yeah. Which is, a, I mean, what you just described is truly a difficult problem. And uh, I really think that it's going to be a technological fix, that eventually we are going to invent some sort of combination of, um, I don't know, drones and cameras and, and software that will allow us to see what is happening at very fine scales and make sense of that. It's going to be a deluge of data. Yeah, I mean, you, you can easily imagine doing this for, let's say, Marlin's duckweed, where you put a drone over Potter's Lake on KU campus. And obviously, you've figured out how to identify individual duckweed. We think for individual, the, 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 that, that image of, of James Brown, that points of light on the backs of every animal, and you see, yeah. So you can do that for each of your individuals of each of your species, and you can map the distribution of each species across that pond, and you can map the physical environment. So the pH and the turbidity and the blah, 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 temperature and all that stuff. So you can, you can imagine doing it. I think it's very clear that it has to be time specific. Yeah. And that all of the scales of time and space will be essentially scaled to the species in question. Now, I wonder, Town, if what you are describing, which I agree that um, should be the future, is not what the future for community ecology is going to be. And, and, and I consider myself a biogeographer and a macroecologist, not, not a community ecologist. So, okay, community ecologists go do that, but I am still at the larger scales. Now it's my turn to take on you, Tano. Uh-oh. This is not, this, this what you have, have just described is not different from what co-occurrence is. <laughs> not at all, perdón, sorry, but. <laughs> If, if let's just imagine we had this map of Potter's Lake, which to a duckweed is like an ocean, right? It's a, for those of you who don't know KU campus, it's probably what, 60 meters by 60 meters. <laughs> um, but to a duckweed, which has leaves like this, it's huge. Now, if I had those data, let's say daily data of the distribution of every species, and the distribution of the physical environments. Then essentially using some smart analysis, I could set up and ask the question whether a species simply follows its profile of optimality of physical conditions. I like this pH, this temperature, this, 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 this or whether my response to those physical environmental <coughs> qualities is modulated by the, by the proximity or the presence of another species. So I would be able to set up analyses that would sort out whether it's just the physical environmental factors or whether my responses to those physical environmental factors 
are changed by whether the other species is there present. That's concurrence. No, it isn't. <laughs> it's well, it's, it's, it's what you can do with concurrence. Okay, right now. but but remember, I'm I'm contrasting simple co-occurrence with relationship to environmental factors. Okay, in in a, in a modeling algorithm, you can in, introduce that information and let the algorithm to figure out the interaction between the different predictors. They no, are... It's going to be a, a, an, an analysis on top of the modeling algorithm. I mean, let, let's be clear. Going back to that debate that I mentioned, all that the only information that, that the proponents of co-occurrence equals interaction, the only thing that they're bringing to in, in terms of data is co-occurrence. Now, with what I just laid out, you would be able to see whether a given species, your focal species, is able to survive under these circumstances only if the other species is present, that's a positive interaction, or if it is able to survive under these circumstances only if the other species is absent. That's a negative interaction. Right, but we didn't have information on survival. Well, we only have information on presence and absence of, of, yeah. of species on, on one side. On, and we have uh, on, on the side of the physical variables, we have the magnitude or, or, or the values of the right, future. but but assuming yep. that occurrence reflects suitability of conditions, then that's the same as survival, right? If if the water gets too hot here, then within a few days or a few weeks, my species won't be there anymore. I'm just saying that the the co-occurrence equals interaction paradigm. I don't even want to call it a paradigm because it's a false paradigm. Yeah, yeah, I agree on that. But that only brings the spatial co-occurrence or the spatial proximity. And what, what we would bring in this imaginary world where we've mapped physical environment and biotic environment is we'd be able to ask whether the distribution of a given species is only a consequence of its physical requirements or whether biotic information modulates those physical requirements. And that's more than co-occurrence. Yes, but uh, in terms of, of availability of data, yeah. Let, let me think how, how to so we, explain We were it, talking but... about this ideal world where we're mapping stuff that we've never been able to map before. And so we have a, a drone positioned over Potter's Lake every day for 10 years. And that drone is able to identify all, what, three species of duckweed in the lake, Marlon? Yeah, three, three. And all of a whole suite of neat physical parameters. So we're getting the biotic and the abiotic information. But that information, you can, you can have it right away. I mean, you don't need the, to, to have the ideal world. In the, in the real world, we have information on the physical variables and we have information on the, on the presence or absence yeah. of, of but quality. we don't have information on what do they do to each other. That's right. That's right. But we neither do do have that information with the drunk. If we I only did have this daily, of the if I yeah, did this daily, I'd be able to see if my two species are co-occurring on day forty-two. What's going on on day forty-three or 40, 10, 45? Oh, but it will be correlational information. You need to go and do the experiments and, and look yourself and see 
this thing is eating this one or this thing is removing the, the nutrients from the water of this other one. Do, do you or, not agree that the analysis of physical requirements only versus physical plus biotic would be informative? It would be informative, but not necessarily a proof. It's not going to be definitive, no. But remember, we use we use niche modeling not to be definitive. We use niche no. modeling to get some information in situations where we usually have none. But we are humble about it. Or at least some of us are humble about it, and we know that there are limitations and there are caveats. Right. I'm just trying to set up a situation where we do have enough information to bring in the biotic dimension. Enrique, I don't think I agree with you that we have that information now. We have this kind of ramshackle, random, partial view of the, bi of the biotic dimension. And I'm talking about getting comprehensive biotic information every time period through time yeah, we didn't have that but we okay. never have it, and this need for the discussion biases and gaps because and it's... Stuff that we've talked about screw it up okay we we do not have that for jaguars for example or for whatever species we want to talk about we have it for essentially no species we have no that in, i agree we didn't have that information uh, yeah. in terms of of the quality of of, of interactions or, or yes. the existence even of interactions. Okay. We only have information on the occurrence of a species. But we could get that information yeah. using you know, the technology. Yeah, I agree with Tony. And but this is this is how biology is. Like that's why biology cannot be solved in a set of equations without natural history information yeah, and without natural. going to the field. And, you know, I've been going to that lake or pond, like, you don't know how many days in my, in these last three years. And you can actually see what's going on. And you can actually tell, okay, this species, when it starts growing, it's gonna, this, like, it's gonna replace all this area that is covered by this other species that starts growing, like, before in the year after the winter ends and stuff like that. But you have to be there. And it's really easy to me because like, it's like five minutes or 10 minutes from my house. So I can go, but imagine doing that for jaguars or even for more populations of this same species. Mm -hmm. So that's another thing. This is one population only. And we're talking ecological niches about like population level, but it's species. In, re in reality, we're modeling the species niches and the species niches, we're trying to insert those interactions in the species niches. So imagine how difficult is that? So I can, I have to call people in, around the world to yeah. start doing the same thing I'm doing here in this pond and probably trying to find the same three species in the pond <laughs> because I had three species because we have said some ponds we have three other species or five species <laughs> exactly. or just one species. There is one example that I know uh, the, where that kind of interaction has been documented across the entire range of the species is with oaks and the galls, which are caused by Hymenoptera and the parasitoids of those galls. It was done in Europe and it required a team of researchers over many countries to go the same days and look at the same things and take the same measurements. And that's a great paper. But how many of those? I have been trying to look for more and there are not too many. It's a lot of effort to do the natural history at the scale of a, of a range. <laughs> and, and at least one plant was involved, right? Plants don't move. <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay, uh, I'm afraid you have blown another hour of your life on ENM 2020. Um, obviously, we can we can stay on this topic for quite a while, yeah. um, but I think this gives the the course participants the idea of how complicated this is. It's scale dependent in time. 
It's scale dependent in space. We have limitations to the theory and we have huge limitations to the data. Essentially, can the data be generated at all? So it's complicated. But maybe the most important thing to do is to think about it. Are there direct interactor species known for your species, the one that you're interested in? Or is it all diffuse and, and multiple species and probably Eltonian noise? Anyhow, Eltonian noise. Um, thanks, guys. And sorry to cut this off, but I got to cut this off. Uh, thanks a million and see you all next week.